those forks in the road, like that's when you find out kind of what you are capable of. Experience the freedom that you are given. That's what freedom is to me, is the ability to do what you want. You feel as if you are exactly where you should be, when you should be there. And you go out of your comfort zone, and I believe that that's one of the things that really kind of shows you what you're made of. And if you never leave, you never know. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Athletic Stance Podcast. On today's episode, we have a very badass, very underrated individual, someone who has grown up in Alta and who had many a legend in his house while he was growing up. His father is an amazing photographer and it bred him into an amazing skier by having the mountains really be kind of his daycare and he grew up skiing with uh johnny collinson among other people um and it was just a pleasure to sit down with him this is his very first podcast he talks about some of his future plans and I will let the podcast do the talking on today's episode check it out Mr. Samo Cohen. Yeah, so the brothel, Peak of Hill Repute. Brothel, Peak of Hill Repute. <laughs> <laughs> what well, was that trip like? Obviously, in contrast to, you know, that that trip with Dane and Tanner and all them. Well, so the brothel, that was my first, like, expedition, we'll call it. You know, that was a like self-produced film i had that you know zone in my mind i had seen the photos that greg von dorsten had shot of uh, jeremy jones and nobis on that wall years ago and it's a huge topic up in haynes the brothel and corrugated like they're these famous spine walls but they're super elusive like they're actually in canada which is the hilarious part about it so Basically for that, um, I partnered up with Drake Olson, who's this bush pilot out of Haynes. Not a huge fan of the industry. He really loves climbers because climbers in his mind are the real deal, right? They go out. They're not expecting anything. They go out there. They don't have cameras. They have a limited food. They're going light and fast. And uh, when he saw how much shit I wanted to bring out there, I never heard the end of it. But the first flight I ever did with Drake, so I kind of get motion sickness, which is a hilarious thing, really. Like, I threw up in my mitten in the heli once, and like, yeah, just ridiculous. But uh, first flight I took with Drake ever, I puked in this bag the whole entire flight, yet I never took my eyes off the terrain. And so Drake liked me after that, which was funny. He doesn't like that much, that many people. And so we had this bond and, uh, you know, we flew past the brothel. We went and looked at it. This is like two, three years later or whatever. And, you know, it doesn't really look doable. Like obviously the spine wall itself looks doable, but it's sitting on this thousand to 2000 foot hunk of hanging ice and rock. So it's like when Jeremy and Jeremy, did that you know i don't know for sure but i'm guessing they skied the spine wall into the bowl there in the heli landed picked him up and that was it and that was before there was the gps on the heli and all these rules and this and that and uh it's different now they can't just fly over into fucking canada drop some dudes off do this do that and the other like there's a you know there's a lot more rules it's a little more strict these days so I knew the only way we could hit that was on foot. And it took the whole trip pretty much. Like we had terrible snows, the worst snow that I've ever had up in Haynes. And uh, it took the whole entire trip to finally figure out that line. Like I'd spotted this bridge. Essentially there was these cruxes to get away from it. The spine wall itself 
was the most moderate part of the mission, like getting to the brothel, you know, basically like we went through a rapid warming and a crazy wind cycle and, uh, all we skied was shit snow for 85% of that trip, which was 20 days on the glacier. That team was, it was an interesting team that I'd put together. There's my buddy, Zach Halverson, who I'd met on the junior tour. He lives from Girdwood, Alaska, done a lot of skiing with him. My, you know, my next dude was Henry Gates, who's my roommate. Now he's, you know, he's my best ski partner. I have, we've done countless different ski descents together. You know, he's an awesome ski partner. Then I had McKenna Peterson, who I've skied with quite a bit, but never in the real mountains. She's my teammate at Scott. She's an awesome person to be around. You know, she had actually lost her dad earlier that winter. And so I thought this was going to be something to help her kind of move past that to like get her back in it. And uh, I remember I'm at, I'm in Juneau doing the shopping and she calls me and she's like, Sam, I'm not coming. And uh, kind of like, uh, like what? <laughs> and I was like, okay, Mac, like I get it. You know, just think about this a little bit and call me back. Don't make any hasty decisions. And she had been hanging out with uh, Lucas Dabari at the time, you know, famous snowboarder, awesome dude, awesome climber. She called Lucas. She talked to him about it. She ended up changing her mind, flying up there the next, you know, three days later or whatever, and uh, staying on the trip. Then I had my buddy Elliot Bernhagen. He's, you know, he's someone you should honestly do what a, a podcast with. The dude's a lunatic. <laughs> amazing dude like a lot of people are you know they question him he's a little pushy a bit aggressive but he's an incredible athlete and you know i know him from climbing i met him through patrick orton who was his best friend you know he had moved from chicago elliot moved from chicago out to colorado i can't remember where i want to say like is there a college in glenwood springs yeah, Glenwood Springs. I think there's a Colorado Mountain College there. So I want to say he moved there and he met Pat. And Pat was from Sandpoint, Idaho. I don't know if you heard of Pat. Maybe you did, but uh, Patrick, he was an incredibly talented photographer is what he was. He was you know, I met him at some point at like the SI, at OR show or something at Salt Lake and he ended up coming up to Baker one trip and we shot a bunch together. And then uh, I'm, him and Elliot lived in this camper together, this Palomino, right? There are two dudes, one camper. That was their whole thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're both <laughs> lunatics, right? He's like, all right, send this. <laughs> Elliot's like, all right, sending. And they're just like getting shots. Patrick was just like, <laughs> he had the most momentum out of, any photographer in the industry at that point for sure he was just young building his portfolio but doing an incredible job and uh so i met they had come to haynes every year and stayed at the funny farm at bruce bauer's spot and uh i met elliot that summer the following summer patrick died he um yeah he passed away jumping off a bridge that he had jumped off probably his whole life just a small one, you know, into Lake Ponderé there. And uh, Elliot inherited all of Patrick's camera gear. And uh, George, Pat's dad, he was the one who gave Elliot this gear. Obviously, Elliot, like, he just lost his best friend who he lived with. And uh, Elliot spent a lot of the time in Sandpoint that summer. And I remember, like, I barely knew Elliot, but I was on a climbing trip up to Squamish. I had lost all my, like, all my partners bailed on me. And uh, I decided to drive through Sandpoint. And I was like, Elliot, I'm going to come meet up. And we hung out for an afternoon, I want to say. And uh, our relationship just kind of grew from there. We've climbed a lot of walls together. We climbed the Elephant's Perch. Our both first time climbing the Elephant's Perch together. Um, you know, last year we were climbing up in California in the Sierras on the Hulk and I was actually on the phone with him like an hour ago. He, you know, we're talking about this bugaboo trip. And uh, so Elliot was on the trip. 
he was the still photographer who came to the brothel with us. And uh, then my buddy, Steve Mace, who I met on the Grand Canyon, I was assisting a trip for a local ski patroller, Andrew McCloskey. And I met this dude, Steve Mace, who guides skiing in the Wallawa Mountains. Super good dude. He's kind of like one of those individuals who um, grounds everyone. And I knew we needed someone like that. Like, we just needed someone like that. And so we had this random crew of people. And, okay, one other dude, Tim Jones, a filmer from here who I had never worked with. Barely even knew the dude. But Nate couldn't go. And I was just in a pinch. And so I knew Tim was a climber. And I trust climbers. I know that they are smart, methodical, and they know how to use ropes which is a huge thing, obviously, on the glacier. And uh, the fact that he was a filmer, we were just getting two birds stoned, right? So uh, that was our crew. Most of these dudes did not know each other. Uh, it was a hilarious crew. You know, we weren't the most efficient team, but we got it done. The brothel itself was interesting. It had these two cruxes. Like, essentially, you hike from camp, across the flats up this valley that was kind of on the back side of it we went up to this coal dropped this north face of this hanging glacier right unbelievable snow you know solid snowpack you wouldn't be doing any the only reason any of this was possible was because of how good like how locked in the pack was it was kind of needle in a haystack type of thing but we hadn't seen anything our biggest like worry was warming from the south side of cornices, right? Warming of cornices, dropping into the north facing shots, which a lot of these spine walls like corrugated, brothel. Uh, there's this one called the test monkey. They wrap from west to uh, east, essentially. And a lot of them is north facing. And uh, so that was the main concern. But so you drop this north facing run, then you skin back up this glacier valley cross a couple Bergstrons, climb this couloir that dumps you right on top of the spine wall. So, you know, a few miles, a few thousand feet from camp and you're on the spine wall. Once you ski the spine wall, that's when the real adventure starts. I mean, it's, you know, it's the, one of the best descents of my life, just the overall descent, which isn't something really I got to talk about much in the film because we didn't have any footage of the lower half which i was you know obviously i was bitching about it yeah but i couldn't bitch too much because i was so psyched like we were all so happy on what we had done like we set out to climb and ski this line and we achieved it the snow is subpar but it worked once you had skied the spine wall which is relatively short and pretty straightforward you had to cut skiers right there's this big ice block in this little chute. You go down this chute, air this sketchy Bergstrand that puts you kind of on this like floater island, right? You ski out this island, do to do to do, like towards all the cracking ice. And uh, there's this bridge. There's no more than four feet wide. And I'd spotted this from the plane and I kept babbling about how this was our exit. And, you know, no one really believe me except for henry henry was kind of like oh i bet we can do that but i think we'll have to rope up and uh i get to this bridge and i'm looking at henry and you know i like i'm saying like i really love climbing and there's this thing in climbing where there's like free climbing right can you free it and so i'm like henry we can free it i think we can free it man and uh yeah so i just start skiing out onto this bridge thing and it's a like a real spine right like big drop racks on both sides. You're just like making little hippie turns, like cruising out this bridge. I mean, it was a surreal moment because, you know, I'd been looking at it, looking at it, looking at it. And it was just an ch interesting change in skiing for me where I realized what was possible. And uh, once you get out that bridge, you access this lower yeah. shoulder, you drop a super long, I don't know, 1,500 foot, 2,000 foot, uh, client run i'm gonna call it into the bottom of the circu where it's just flat 
you're in the mm-hmm. glacier bottom. From there, you had to climb, I don't know, three to 4,000 feet up high, a few miles, and then ski down to camp. And we got back to camp. It was like nighttime. And I remember Steve and Tim, because they had gone up a totally different way to film the thing. They were at camp chilling like hours before. And I hear on my uh, radio, Steve kept playing Tenacious D. <laughs> It was ridiculous. And Elliot actually stayed at camp that day. Drake flew in in his fucking plane, picked up Elliot, and just miraculously it worked. And Elliot was able to shoot it out of the plane, right? Like, I remember I'm approaching the top of the coulee to the backside of the spine, right? And I hear Elliot coming over the radio. All of a sudden, I see the plane. All of a sudden, everything's in motion. It was like, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. And, uh, I get back to camp and Elliot and Steve are duetting um, karate. You know that song? Uh uh-uh. uh. It's ridiculous. I'm not going to sing it for you, but <laughs> probably should. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was an incredible trip. It was a cool experience. And uh, fuck, I was 24, yeah. I want to say. And. Um, just the experience putting all that trip together and something actually working. It was a change. Like you're always battling this wall, right? You feel like there's this like anti, like for me, I'm like, there's this anti Sam barrier. I just can't seem to get through it. And that was like a breakthrough moment where something that I envisioned worked. Yeah. And nothing ever works exactly how you plan, but it worked. Yeah. And, uh, you know, since then there's been, not everything has worked, but things have worked and, uh, it was a really cool experience. And, yeah. um, yeah, this year I'm actually looking at putting together another trip, not to there, but, um, to Mount Waddington. And, uh, you know, that's the highest peak in BC. It's a crazy looking mountain. I'm hoping that we can maybe put a new ski descent down on Waddington. We'll see. I've been studying the area quite a bit and uh, it looks pretty rowdy, but you know, I'm going to be going there in May. Sick. Yeah. So I'm really excited. That'll be like the, the level up from the brothel. Damn. Okay. Yeah. I'm s- stoked to see what comes out of that. Yeah. Me too. Fuck. <laughs> Two questions that come to mind. One is, yeah. How long were you, because you were camped out at the brothel for quite a bit, waiting for that window of opportunity, right? How long were you out there for? We were out there for 20 days. Wow. Yeah, it was a long time. We could have gotten on it sooner, but uncertainty kind of left us to going later than we had intended. Yeah. But, I mean... I will never consider that a bad move. Like I, there was a couple times where, you know, I remember waking up one morning and it was always my call kind of. And so I'd wake up before everyone and, you know, I, it just didn't feel right. Like I remember that night and I didn't know what it was going to entail at this point. And that night I'm laying there, you know, and I happened to be thinking about like my lady at the time. I'm like, fuck, like, I want to be able to see her again. I want to be able to go home after this. Like, I don't want tomorrow to be the end. Yeah. And uh, sometimes it's hard. You get blindsided by your own ambition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's happened to me many times in the past. And that day didn't feel right. We didn't go. A few days later, we did and it worked. Yeah. You know, like you had said before, patience. Yeah. That wasn't something I had really, you know, before that. Like, it was interesting. It was honestly a broken heart. Like, that was a thing that got me into this new realm of taking my time and just like not being concerned about the world around me. And like, Salt Lake is a super high energy place. And I noticed that when I'm here is how the pace of life is moving so fast. Yeah. And Alaska is the opposite of that. It's slow and it's different. Yeah. And so it's easier to feel, you know, and kind of be in tune with what you're feeling. Yeah. 
Totally. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, whenever you're on an, an island that, you know, is like a little bit more remote, it's like mm -hmm. island time, you know? Exactly. And same thing. You're, you're on an island up in Alaska. It's just a different type of island. Yeah. You're just on tent island or whatever. <laughs> and so you're hanging out in your tent and it's good. It's yeah. Good. Yeah. Totally, man. So the next question that came to mind is, how do you start looking at these uh, descents and uh, like what, what goes into that research process of like, okay, well, this is my ambition. So obviously I need to gather up enough information about it to create a roadmap, to create a plan of execution that is loosely put together, at least a skeleton of what I hope to see happen. And when, if and when that comes to fruition, this, you know, this is how I hope to see it pulled together. But how do you, you know, how do you do that type of research? What's the, you know, what's the process behind that? Well, you know, obviously it first starts with like attraction. You see something, you're like, that is amazing. Like, I want to ski that or like, I want to hook up with that girl or like whatever it is. Right. And, uh, so for me, like my first trip to Alaska was when I was 20 years old. And I remember I hung it out there. I spent my college fund. Like I was really like, all right, this is it. Like I'm gonna make it or break it. I know this is the place to do it. And, uh, you don't really know what you can do until you test your limits. Right. Mm -hmm. So first thing you look at really is like, is it actually skiable? Meaning like, what is the Bergstrom like? What are the cornices like? How steep is it? Where's the slough going to go? Am I going to have to stop here, do this and that? Because a lot of times, you know, same thing. You get blindsided by your ambition and that's really when things can go south. And so for the brothel, it was like, okay, I see the spines are doable. But the exit is looking pretty hairy. I don't even know if that's doable. And that one truly was a gamble. Like we brought, you know, you take every piece of equipment you got, screws, you know, ropes, harness, everything you have to make sure you can get out of there. And mm -hmm. even then, like we had a backup plan. Like I knew I could climb back up the spine if I had to, if the exit wasn't going to go. So that's our plan B, which I did not want to do at all like it just sounded yeah. scary like hanging out in there for that much longer you know and mm -hmm. uh so looking at it is it actually feasible like what and being honest with yourself about your skill set like do i have the skills to ski this do i have the skills to you know build an anchor right here and do I have the gear that it's going to take to get me in and out of here safely? You know, and do I have the skills to get out of here if things turn, you know, a wrong so, corner? Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, Henry, I mentioned before, my roommate, he has a really good head on his shoulders. Like him and I, we ski tour together, you know, all like five days a week. Right. And uh, I seem to be <laughs> jonesing a lot. And he seems to be, questioning that and it's always yeah. a good thing you know it's mm -hmm. never a bad thing to turn back and knowing that you might turn back you know and being okay with that that's a huge part of that process and so like for this year looking at these new descents in the waddington area i'm looking at it and i'm kind of like okay like that looks like it could be doable and then you do some research you find maybe someone done something similar, right? Like first I was looking at this thing, Mount Tiedemann. I'm like, okay, you got to come out of camp, climb 3000 feet, do a little bit of mixed, go up this other thing, go like up this shoulder, drop this 2000 foot face. And then you're in some other freaking zone and then come back over and down this 3000 foot line to camp. And I'm like, is that doable in a day? 
And so I'm starting to do research. I find there's been one descent of this peak. And that is not what they did. <laughs> they got dropped up in the high circ above the first 3,000 foot climb. They spent two nights trying to ski this thing. And that was their process. Yep. But as we've seen with dudes like Killian Jornet or like Alex Honnold, those are just like big, obvious people. But there's other dudes around here, like the DeRay brothers, Andy and Jason, and um, other inspiring people like Noah Howell. And, you know, in a day has become this huge thing. And as, you know, evolution of our sports and just humans in general and your mind is open, people see things differently. Yep. I, you, sometimes, you don't really know sometimes. It'll change as you're going. In the brothel, like I was fixated on that line. But I didn't really know if it was going to go. Like we spent, I mean, we spent two weeks hanging out, two and a half weeks before we actually went for that. Yeah. We skied all sorts of other runs. A lot of those guys had never skied in, in Haynes and uh, they had barely skied spines. And, you know, I wasn't going to go put them in the shit. And if I did, that was, would have been on me. That was yeah. a bad move on my part. And, you know, Elliot is always chirping at me about how, oh, you shouldn't have done that. You should have had this and that and the other. And Drake, too. He was like, if you would have been with this guy and this guy, like you guys would have been able to do this, that, and that. Because they're, you know, they think, they believe that I'm able to do these things, these big things. But a lot of it is surrounding yourself with the right crew. Yeah. And so for this Waddington mission, I'm taking that lesson that I learned at the brothel and applying it to this trip and, you know, trying to get some of my mentors mm -hmm. to come with, not trying to just forge my own fucking path. Cause you know, that's just hard, man. Like I've done that with climbing. Like I taught myself how to place a cam. I taught myself how to boulder. I taught myself how to aid climb, like, and it's a slow process and I've gotten hurt a lot doing that. Yeah. And, uh, having someone who knows more, is all is never a bad thing and you will progress faster and you'll learn more and you'll be able to achieve the things you want to achieve yeah so like that's kind of where i'm at for this waddington thing and you know i'm looking at these lines i'm sending them to my mentor i'm like what do you think about this does that even look like a possibility like we got to summit waddington and go over here and do this that and the other and then go down the line yeah and then we're way the fuck below camp we got to climb some huge ice fall back is this even a feasible thing mm -hmm. it's hard to see that like i said already multiple times with the ambition level being so high and you feel like you can do so much it's just an easy way to get killed is all. And, uh, you know, I don't want that. No one wants that. And, but again, like you never know what you're capable of. Yeah. Until you go out and try. Yeah, totally. And that's kind of the risk and the reward and the adventure to me. Like that's just, that's what the adventure is. And I feel like that's how you find out kind of what you're actually made of. Like, Fred Becky was never like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. This guy told me I can't do this. It's like 1940 fucking two. And he's going out to Mount Waddington with his 15-year-old brother. And they're hiking in from the coast. They're just going. They made it. Yeah. Dude was 17 years old. Yeah. He definitely didn't know what he was getting into. <laughs> and, it was, you know, it was a different time. But uh, I still believe that sense of – in that sense of adventure – and it is dying, especially in our industry and in skiing, where a lot of things are kind of laid out for people. I don't want to point fingers anywhere, but like, so maybe you've heard of the 50 Project yeah. recently. Yeah. So, you know, like three, four years ago, I started thinking, oh, I want to ski the 50 Classics. And I start ticking away at it. And Noah Howell, who's from here, you know, he's done more than half of them. And if you've done your back work on those, you know that it's something you'll take your whole life to do and you may never do it. Yep. The ambition level is respectable, but the sense of having someone who's been 
in all these areas who skied these peaks, maybe who knows everything about them. I think it, and having them go with you, it takes a lot of the adventure away. So it's just interesting. Whereas like Noah, you know, he's planned his own mission on all 27 or eight of those that he's done. And like last year, Silas and I, uh, we went and skied Mount Stimson, which is a, you know, big peak in Glacier National Park. Henry and I tried to ski it two years ago. All we did was bushwhack for three days. Never even hit snow. <laughs> it's brutal, man. Like, it sucked. Oh, man. And uh, they had a record year last year. Silas and I go back. It's a monster peak. Like, it's out there. It's truly out there. And it's a 5,000-foot fall line face. It's not like crazy steep skiing or anything, but it's just a mission. And, uh, you know, having fully failed the year prior, going back out there with Silas and uh, succeeding was interesting to me and just how much it took for us to really do that. Yeah. And not believing for a second that we couldn't do it. Yeah. Just totally. going out and doing all of our own research and really trying to make something that was new to us. Yeah. And uh, so that's a huge, like, that's an important thing to me. And obviously you want all the beta you can have, but there is a point where it's like, you know, you know, D, you know, whatever D Y I, right. Like do it yourself, man. DIY yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and just like figure something out, mm -hmm. teach yourself something. Yeah. Don't have it laid out for you. Yeah. I mean, you talked about evolution and, and how, you know, like one of the, the most amazing things about humans is that we are so adaptable to at each and every situation. If we allow ourselves to be, and if we, you know, like if you can drop that ego, but, also know deep down like you said you know that you can do it so it's that balance of like right being egoless but knowing inside that you can do it and it's like okay how do i put the pieces together in a way that it comes together and like you are hanging in the balance of of life and death situations real life and death situations sure. but yeah. You know, how do you make those calculations and find that that narrow road that's going to continually keep you moving forward? And, you know, like just because the road forks or the road, you know, bends a little bit doesn't mean that you, you know, like you, that you need to put on training wheels necessarily, you know? Yeah, exactly, though. Like, yeah, it's true. And, uh, those forks in the road, like that's when you find out kind of yep. what you are capable of. Yep. And it is truly, I mean, it's corny or whatever, but like it is what's within. Mm -hmm. And if you're willing to dive in there, cause I truly believe that a lot of people live their lives in fear, man. And like, Fear controls their actions and whether they keep this nine to five job or like, you know, I got a good buddy and he was working at this ski touring shop or whatever. And I'm like, dude, let's go to the bugaboos. Like, let's go to here. Let's go there. He's like, oh, dude, I got work. I'm like, who fucking cares? Like, quit that stupid job and let's go. Yeah. There's going to be a thousand other stupid jobs. Like, don't be afraid you know, to bend the rules a little bit or not even bend the rules, but to experience the freedom that you are given. Yeah. That's what freedom is to me is the ability to do what you want. Yeah. What you want, exactly. when you want with the people that you want to do it with, you know, that's like exactly. that's real, true freedom. That's real. Exactly. Real, true freedom. Yeah. And, you know, obviously not everyone is that, you know, they don't have that a lot of people. Yeah. But if you do have that and you aren't exercising that, what's the point of even having it? And so that's just kind of how I see it. And I, you know, one day maybe my sights will change, but I've kind of always been like that. And 
I'm continuing to be like that almost more these days. Just like, you know, these are the things that I want to do. And I think it's from like, like I said, you know, you fail, fail, fail. You're trying so hard and you're just hitting this wall. And then you have a breakthrough like on the brothel or on Mount Stimson. And then it leaves you in an area where you're like, okay, like I can do that. Like I did that. And now like I compare all my ski hikes to Stimson, like this brutal bushwhack with the rivers and the this and the that, you know, I slept in a snow hole that night or whatever. And like there's grizzly bears and shit. And it's just an, it's such an interesting peak with all these variables. And it was, you know, and a lot of it is who you're with too. Yeah. Like Silas may be silent a lot of times, but when it gets down to it, he's not. Yeah. He's just selective. Yeah. And um, I'm not quite like that. Like I, I talk a lot. I'm very like opinionated and uh, there's a good balance being with him. Cause we skied together all last April. Like we started out filming. I was working on a project at the hut up at the meadow hut and uh, knew I wanted him on it. Cause I'd skied with him earlier that year. And he's an unbelievable skier. Good dude to have around. Yeah. It's one of the best skiers I've ever worked with easily. Yeah. Then we kept on skiing. We got out of the hut. I saw a quick window on my phone weather. Cause I was just looking all year for Stimson. We rallied down there got that thing rallied back up to Canada, went snowmobile and went over to the Canadian Rockies, put down a descent on, um, North Victoria, which is, uh, in Lake Louise. It's one of the most photographed peaks in the world. Actually. Like if you're standing on Lake Louise and you're looking across, you're looking at it and it's this big steep face up on this thousand foot hanging bench, fucking gnar that one worked too. And it's just interesting. Like if you're just persistent and you try and you think and you just, you know, just go for it sometimes. Yeah. And hopefully that doesn't, you know, bite me in the tail, but, uh, I think that I'm still going to think like that for years. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you got to put yourself out there. You got to take the time to, the time, energy, and effort. And it's a calculation. Like you said, you're looking at the weather window. You've done your research. It's not like you're just yeah. willy-nilly like, I heard about this peak somewhere and I'm going to go send it. Like, And I mean, exactly. sometimes if it, if it really is in your heart to do it, like, yeah, go do it. But do your research on the way and find, you know, put the yeah. piece together, go with the right equipment, go with the right crew. But also, yeah, yep. I mean, it's like find that balance of what, you know, truly living is. And like, for some people that it may not be the pursuit of, of mountains, the way that you have where, you know, right. That for, for them, it might be different, but like you said, like that nine to five will always exist. And if you're afraid of your relationship with the person above you, the manager, the boss, whatever, then, you know, like if that person doesn't support you going out and experiencing life, the way that you deserve to that, that freedom that we talked about, then, maybe it isn't the best, you know, relationship. And like, you know, it's important to find the people who are going to support you who do understand it. And if they don't like know that it's your life and you don't owe that time is the only non-renewable resource that you have. So you, yeah, you know, like you can definitely, man. you can find more money. You can find another house. You can find another job. You can find more of pretty much anything else in the world besides mm-hmm. time. That's the only thing yeah. you can't buy more of, right? It's true. So, and uh, use it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, use it accordingly. Seriously. Yeah. Do you have any like morning or evening routines that you stick to? Um, like, obviously, you've lived a van life. Like, you have like a pretty, your life kind of moves and bends and takes shape with the vessel that you're given or the opera, you know, the reality right. that you place yourself in. But, do you have any like morning or evening routines or like, do you practice meditation or, you know, is there anything like that that you stick to? I like, I'm pretty kind of just all over the place. Like, as you know, my mind is like that as well. But, uh, you know, when lately, like, you know, just living in this house for the past few months, I mean, I was in Austria for a few weeks, but I've been here for like a 
you know, a month now. And, uh, yeah, that's weird for me too. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I find myself already itching, but, um, yeah, you know, like it depends on the day, but so if I'm going on an early ski tour, which I would say is on average, let's say it's four days a week. I wake up, I turn the coffee on, I throw some bacon in the pan and I let that go. Yeah. I go and do whatever bathroom shit, get my clothes ready. I'll throw my skins on, do this, do that. I'll maybe, you know, I like to eat sweet potatoes. So I'll cut up a sweet potato and uh, throw that in the pan as I'm kind of pulling out the bacon and then I'll eat the bacon as I'm making this other thing. I always think I'm going to put it all together, but I never do. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I crack a couple eggs in there, throw a bunch of cheese on it, and I eat that. That's pretty much my morning breakfast, you know, five days a week. It's where I'm, like, doing computer stuff, which late, you know, the past few days, the snow is kind of – it's getting a little warmer here, and we're not in such a – we've been in such a good cycle lately that there's just been so much skiing and uh, working on this film project. It's a three piece here, Haynes and uh, Waddington. And so we're working on the project. I've been, I've been like really tired. And uh, so the past few days I've been working on the computer a lot. And when it's a computer day, I won't even eat a lot of times. <laughs> like I'll wake up and uh, right away, six thirty, probably seven, I'll just start on my computer sending emails, drafting emails, writing whatever down. I'll be drinking coffee. As soon as I start to get unproductive, I go to the climbing gym. And I spend a few hours there. I ride the bike, you know, I climb. I'll come back and I'll try and get back on the computer. So that's been that's kind of the off day routine. Yep. And it just depends. Like it's a, it's a different season thing. Like early in the winter, I'll wake up, I'll do some computer. I'll go to the climbing gym. I'll go ski and I'll just repeat that process until it's on. And then I'll be doing the coffee and the bacon and the ski touring and then, uh, crashing probably at like four in the afternoon, just hitting a wall in the summers. I wake up, I start texting people to go climb before I'm even out of my bed. I'll hit up like five, six different people, whoever responds first. (laughs) Like, all right, let's go. And uh, we go climb up in Little Cottonwood or wherever, you know, whatever vessel, like you had said, wherever I am, I kind of adapt to other people's morning routines as well. Yeah. The morning is usually a really productive time for me. And so whether it's computer or hiking or, uh, you know, climb, I try and just take advantage of that ambition in the morning. Yeah. So I don't really have a routine. Like I don't meditate. I don't do yoga. I would like to pick it up. I kind of have a bad hip and uh, this is a whole, I mean, I have a whole nother story about that. I want to hear it, but. uh, Let's do it. Let me. uh... All right. It's yeah. This was probably the sketchiest thing that's ever happened to me. So I'm climbing in the Tetons a year and a half ago. And uh, my buddy Dustin and I, Dustin's one of the dudes that I just have met on the road, right? But he's become a really close friend of mine and really good climbing partner. Total hippie, just classic dude. Classic Oregon dude. He's from uh, Colorado Springs, though. But I met him in Oregon. Actually, I met him through Springs one night in Oregon. Then I was at Indian Creek on a Halloween, huge party. And he's down there and he's dressed up as a pot farmer. That was his thing. And he was coming from Oregon. So he had all this trim, right? And he's just handing it out like candy. And I'm like, I've got to know this dude. (laughs) (laughs) And he recognized me and he remembered from the one night we had hung out. And since then we've been super tight. And, uh, so Dustin and I are in Jackson. We're staying at our good friend Kelly's house. We're thinking we want to try the Grand Traverse. But uh, my knee was hurting. He had gotten smoked by a rock the day before his hand. So we were both kind of like, 
eh, we should like do something. We should lower our ambition a bit. So we're like, oh, let's just go cruise up Irene's Red. Like some classic Alpine, you know, 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, There's some 5'10", uh, variation pitch. And uh, so we were like, oh, we look up some people's times on it, right? Not like fastest times or anything, but we're like, we're pretty amped up. And uh, so we leave the car, not super early or nothing, like 8.30 maybe. We like kind of hike jog up to the base of the route it's up near the grand teton it's like you get up into the moraine and then you cut over to the petzl caves and get up to the base of the route it's like 700 800 foot uh awesome granite route and uh we just start climbing we don't take a break we you know we hike up there we just instantly start climbing we have a 70 meter we're running huge rope lengths and doing a little bit of simul climbing because we're trying to like make time, you know, we're not, but we're not like speed climbing or anything, but, uh, anyway, we're cruising though. And I run into a buddy of mine, Eddie Stevens from here on pitch two or three or whatever. We only did a few pitches. I think the, the routes normally done in seven pitches for us. I think we ran into him on pitch two and, uh, I was just looking ahead and I was like, oh, there's someone in front of us. And then I climb up to him and it's Eddie. And I'm like, oh, dude, what's happening? Like, you don't mind if we cruise past do you? And he's like, oh, no, go for it. Like, we're going to be moving pretty slow. And we cruise past and we do another pitch and we get up to the whatever pitch. I don't remember what it was, but we get to this other party, this dude, Richard, and his son, Cole, who was 17 years old. And uh, Cole had just led his first pitch ever, right? Some five seven section of awesome climbing, real exposed, good gear, and uh, you know we're just like running it out, kind of place. We only brought like five cams that day or some, and a set of nuts, I think. But that's a Teton rack, they say, <laughs> and uh, so we get up to the top of this last pedestal, this big kind of pillar feature. And there's two variations and I'm sitting there and I'm belaying Dustin up and Richard and Cole are standing there and they're like, Oh, like which, you know, which variation are you guys going to go? We're going to, you know, we'll let you guys go wherever. And I was like, Oh, you know, I think we're going to take five and eat something real quick. Why don't you guys just go? Cause we hadn't stopped since we left the fucking car. Yeah. Richard goes, basically there's this like pedestal and then there's a chimney feature. It's like, 12 feet deep and then the wall right Mm -hmm. and there's this goalie running to the climber's right and the goalie to the climber's right there's a 5-8 crack that comes out and summits but there's this sketchy variation with bad gear that if you stand on this pillar and you span across this chimney you know stem across the chimney you get over and you start traversing on these downward facing flakes essentially dustin gets up to me Richard had gone to over to the 510 sketchy variation, but he didn't want to do it. So they came back and they're like, why don't you guys just go? I was telling Dustin when he got to me, dude, I think we should just kind of take five, like, or just go the easy way or whatever. And he's like, no, dude, let's just go this way. Like, you know, it'll be faster. And those guys can go that way or whatever. And we can both climb at the same time. And it didn't take any convincing. I was just like, all right. Oh, sure. and, uh, yeah. And you know, I was going to lead the next bit or whatever. And, uh, I span the gap. I put in one cam, a small cam, 0.3. I move up and left. I put in an even smaller cam. I start dicking around trying to find the way. It was kind of an inobvious wrap around this little corner. I end up falling, ripping out both cams and uh, falling into that chimney. Probably, you know, I fell like 20 feet and I just landed on my back and uh smacked my head luckily i had a helmet on i ruined the damn thing it got me good man like i couldn't see breathe or hear oh and uh i was just laying there in this chimney like and those guys are like you know i didn't hear them obviously and then eventually when i did hear them and my sight kind of came back they were just like yelling down to me 
you know, this is where I'm pretty sure my hip problem is stemming from. Yeah. Uh, like my, I had a backpack on with like, you know, those dromedaries, like those canvas bags that you put water in. Mm-hmm. I had this drum of water in my little red, you know, marmot backpack and uh, saved my spine. Helmet saved me. Dustin was in on a single cam was our anchor. So like I said, we had just been cruising and, you know, 510 wasn't something that we really thought about much. Yeah. It was like, oh, 510, we'll just go quick. You know, that easily could have been the end of me. And just like, that was a huge, that was finally the hit that was like, oh, you are definitely not, like, you need to think. Like, if yeah. you don't feel good about something, don't do it. Yeah. And uh, since then, I've turned back from a lot of things when I didn't feel good. It was crazy how long it took me to get back into climbing. I mean, it wasn't like super long, but it was just like every climb I got on, all I could think about was hitting the damn ground. And uh, I just kept climbing and climbing and trying to push through it. And, uh, you know, finally last fall, I started climbing a lot in Zion and climbing walls out there. And I finally moved through that. Yeah. And it took me quite some time and a lot of different climbs, but I would not be bummed if that never happened again. (laughs) Yeah. I bet. Yeah. That was crazy. I bet you Zion also, like it helps a little, like, uh, it's a little bit more of an unstable surface to plug into. Right. So like, soft yeah super soft so like you really got to pay attention to what's happening there and and, you know be a little extra mindful about definitely so definitely zion is crazy yeah it got me so psyched though like that place is unbelievable yeah man no that sounds crazy sounds like uh i mean it's those times that you you get broken that it doesn't kill you that really actually makes you stronger and makes you a better, you know, a better mountaineer, a better climber, a better skier, a better everything. And, you know, it's, it's about playing that balance of, okay, well, what is the, the balance of pushing your limit, but keeping a little area of buffer, that little pillow, you know, and yeah, I know for sure for me, like I broke my back and then I tore my ACL and then I broke my tibia all in the last three years. And so it's been a crazy experience. Um, and the back and the knee were literally exactly a year apart. Like it less than one, like I think the knee might be a year, two years ago today. And then the back is three years ago in two days. So, um, but that's a bad day for you huh? <laughs> yeah, <right>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm not going skiing anytime soon like <laughs> i'll wait until it's march and then we're good to go again <laughs> yeah. but um both a, a lot of those times like i had this feeling like hey you know you probably shouldn't go like just mm-hmm. take it easy like don't push it yeah. super hard but my mind was pushing me to go super hard as that ambition right i knew i could do it but uh snow conditions changed when i broke my back like it was like a warmer day and then the evening got like colder but it warmed up again before i had made it back out and the moisture kind of got sucked out of the surface of the snow so it was really punchy Uh uh-huh and uh like landed punched broke my ski and tomahawked and like that's you know it's just like you can never predict that that's gonna happen but especially when you're out having a fun day Mm -hmm. and it's even harder to see that sometimes when you're with all these people and the energy's high and you're like, Oh, I'm going to do it too. Or like, Oh, I should do this or yeah. So the thing about that day is I wasn't with anyone. Some tourist walked me tomahawk into the tree, helped me get my ski. I actually got up, skied to the chairlift, got on the chairlift and the people in front of me were bobbing their feet. And I knew uh-huh. that something was wrong when I could feel every little bit that they were bobbing their feet was just making my back ache more and more and more. And I was like, I got Jeez, off the man. chair. I signaled to the ski patrolman I was, or the uh, lift up. I'm like, mm-hmm. I need help. Like just laid down at the top of the lift. 
and was like, I need, I need skeet patrol now. And so uh, what did they like, how'd that, how'd you fix that in your back? Was there any surgeries or anything? No surgery. Um, just lots of rest. Uh Uh-huh. Lots of rest. Gnarly. Man, I remember like, I'm pretty antsy too. I've calmed down a lot since all of these things, but my house in Crested Butte has like, a circle. And I was literally walking in circles three days after it, like trying to just like, like calm my mind down because I couldn't lay in bed. And I was like, literally just like hobbling, like barely. And they gave me this like plastic thing that went around my whole core so that like, I couldn't, anytime I flexed my core, I was like flexed on the back. And so like, I couldn't really flex my core, but yeah, man, I was like so antsy. I like I was just walking circles around the stairs, dude. And uh, were you okay to walk? Uh, they, yeah, it was, it was all good. Um, it probably wasn't advisable. I'm like, I'm pretty. I've done some dumb things. I ran a 10k two months after having ACL surgery. Why? I have no fucking idea. <laughs> but uh, was your knee like fucked or? it definitely that inhibited the healing process i'll tell you that yeah but dude one of those things where uh i just let my ambitions get you know get ahead of me where i was like you know i said i was gonna do this so i'm gonna do this and right but the knee's good now (laughs) knee's good now i can huck now i can do stuff now so you know i didn't do too much damage there it still flares up every once in a while I've got like a, the bursa sac behind the knee that gets inflamed every once in a while. And it's just super painful. It doesn't really do anything besides when it get, gets inflamed, it takes up uh-huh. room and then the knee doesn't quite want to operate the way that it should. But right. for the most part, like, you know, I can do pretty much anything I want, like dirt jumping on the, on the bike and mountain biking and, you know, go hawk, go hit rails, do whatever there. So yeah, it works um probably not the most advisable but yeah i also yeah i also rode uh at least this one was biking but i rode ride the rockies uh two and a half months after surgery something like that which is 500 miles a little bit less than 500 miles on the road bike in less than it's like six days seven days something like that jesus but uh that was good for it (laughs) probably not the best thing no but uh, yeah another one of those things where i'm like i said i was gonna do it i'm gonna do it and everyone around me is like you know you don't have to do this and i'm like like i don't have to for you guys i have to for me you know (laughs) (laughs) which is uh, what everything should be right mm -hmm. yeah totally but uh cool i'm gonna go off a couple rapid fire questions and then all right. we'll wrap it up i would love to cool. do a round two at some point after these next adventures i'd also love to just yeah. meet up and get some turns in and like have yeah for sure dude. marinate in those high boy moments for sure yeah but um yeah i mean it's uh, it's been over two hours now so um yeah word well rapid fire shoot cool what's one technique that you use to overcome fear breathing yeah and visualization yep two very important things um yeah this one may not be quite as rapid fire what do you think about like climate change and the social uh social condition of like city life versus the people that you know we get to spend a lot of time around like we've obviously value nature so much that it's super important to us so like what's your opinion and what's some things that you think that we can do to help I think the main things that we can do to help is all within our own, like carry your cup, right? Don't be using cups all the time. Like have one cup as far as coffee goes. Don't be wasting cups, Ziplocs, like plastic bags. If you do get a plastic bag, reuse it over and over. Like, you know, simple things like reusing things, little things in your everyday life, like carpooling. And um, they're all super obvious things, but uh, when it's inconvenient, people tend to step away from those obvious things. 
Whereas a little bit of inconvenience isn't going to kill you. And, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, like protect our winners is obviously a big advocate, but I don't think necessarily flying on jetliners to all these meetings all the time is the greatest thing. You know, like I love helicopters. I don't think flying in them is the greatest thing. I don't own a snowmobile. I skin as much as I possibly can. And I think just taking the steps in your own life to um, inspire others to maybe take those steps as well. It's kind of, personally for me, that's what I feel like I can do. Yeah, it's like lead by example. No one wants to be preached to and then find like that someone's being hypocritical. Like, you know, exactly yeah yeah it's like it's those hypocritical moments that ruin the movement more than any totally else. so I think for sure living in integrity with what you want to see happen and embracing it in the best you know in the best possible way that you can and mm-hmm. uh, yeah exactly totally agree with that what's one piece of advice you'd pass along to someone that wants to do what you do you know as corny as it sounds i think just kind of believe in yourself and try your hardest and do it for yourself as well. Like don't do it for the others. Don't do it for the Instagram, like know what you can do and focus in and try hard to do that. Like I'm always thinking if I can't do this, there's no way I can do that. So I got to do this. Like you can always try a little harder. Mm -hmm. and until you're actually like failure plus one right it's what they teach you in weight training class or whatever in the eighth grade but to live in that manner is um, a good way to get to take the steps to get where you're trying to go and for me that's kind of something I've always thought about is I gotta push it a little further than I did yesterday I gotta do this a little better than I did last time or if I don't land this trick I'm gonna hike up there and try it again yep and you know that's why i love skateboarding too man like those guys are beasts they just try endlessly until they stomp dude that's what it takes yeah seriously 25 tries 50 tries on one exactly on one trick and early yeah totally and like they're limping up the stairs as they're running back up but they got it in their mind and they're feeling it out and feeling it out and testing and iterating and then that one time it's like that barrier that you're talking about and then you break, you have success. And then all of a sudden you believe in yourself that much more. And then like, you know, next spot. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Just believing in yourself simply like, yeah, you know, corny or not, that's, you know, that's kind of what it takes. Yeah, totally. It doesn't matter if it's corny, if it works, right? Like, (laughs) yeah, totally. And it it isn't really corny if it works, if it's true, then it's true. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what's on the inverse, what's one piece of encouragement or wisdom that you received that stuck with you? Okay. So, you know, I've shot with a lot of different people. I grew up shooting with my old man, Lee, right? Um, one thing he always told me when I first started to branch out and shoot with other guys, uh, was, um, don't do it if you don't want to do it. And, uh, that can save your life. Mm Mm-hmm for sure. Like just, you know, don't do it if you don't want to. And if you're not feeling it, step away. And if someone's going to judge you for that, whatever, Yeah, they're not worth hanging out with in the first, like in the first place. Yep. Those who are true aren't going to judge you for stepping away when you want to step away. Yep. And like listening to that internal truth of like, yeah, because it's so easy to fall into the trap of being the hero for the camera, and that's when you get seriously injured or worse. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Uh, if you could have one significant impact in the world, what would it be? I mean, I've always, like, I've truly always wanted to just inspire others to, like, go for, go for what they want to do in life and don't live by fear. And so, if I could inspire as many people, you know, that's kind of what my goal has been. And it will, I'll still, you know, strive for that goal. You know, it's not the biggest impact in the world. I'm not going to like solve like the world peace or whatever. Like that's just not, it's not going to take a single person to do that. And uh, 
So if I can just inspire others to be their best and try their hardest, yeah, you know, I think that will bring, that would bring, you know, more, bring more out of people. And that's kind of, that's where my head's at. Yeah. And if you inspire someone that inspires someone that inspires someone that inspires someone, it can ripple out into the world in a way that you don't even know the, you know, you don't get to quantify or qualify your impact past that person Mm -hmm. or even with that person. But, you know, if you can make a difference in one person's life, you can change the world in a small way. And it's constantly, yeah, in a small way and involving. Uh, Do you have a favorite travel tip or hack? Uh, either for road tripping, mainly what what people have talked about before is uh, like flying, but road tripping or flying. Music, good music, obviously. Food and like a good crew. Those are huge things that are like, that could make the most boring thing fun. It's all about who you're with. I hate flying. <laughs> yeah. Neck pillow. It's a good thing for flying. Yeah. <laughs> trying to just take a breath and yeah. not get worked up that you're on a plane for 12 hours. Uh, just sit, be calm. Think about the things that you want yeah. to think about, you know, visualize what it is you're looking to do in life. And I believe that those are good things that'll help you achieve your goals. And while you're just sitting in your car or sitting on a plane, it's a great time to do it. Yeah, totally. Is that nothing else you can do? So yeah, can't do much else besides sit. So might as well use your mind a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> make it productive somehow. Yeah, cool. And where's the best place for people to find you if they want to get in touch with you, follow your adventures, anything like that? Instagram, bro. Insta. <laughs> that Insta. Uh, no, either Alta. You know, come find me at Alta. I'll go skiing. We'll just go take a lap or whatever. And I'm always at momentum, the climbing gym. Yeah. When I'm not out skiing in the Wasatch back country. You can definitely find me if you're trying to get away from the people. Yeah. Find me out there. Sweet. <laughs> Living life. I love it, man. Thank you so much for offering so much of your time and your stories and your wisdom and everything. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Dude, thank you, man, for having me. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Dude, seriously, I can't wait to get some turns in in person and, uh, yeah, yeah, go have some fun out there. Hell yeah, brother. Hey, just one more thing before you go. I wanted to say thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I hope that you really enjoyed it. A couple things that I would ask that you do if you enjoyed today's episode. Number one, go follow us on Instagram at The Athletic Stance Podcast. Number two, if you don't mind leaving a review, rating it, and subscribing, It always helps. It helps spread the word. It helps me know what you guys are enjoying or not. And if you don't mind leaving a comment on Instagram, letting me know what you're enjoying, what you're not enjoying, I will always take into consideration and feel free to send me a message with recommendations on who you'd like to hear from, what you'd like to hear us talk about. And as always, thank you so much for listening, for your time, and we'll see you next time at the Athletic Stance Podcast.